Okay, you're recording. Oh, okay, you're just crashing. Right. Are you helpful? Far. <laughs> right. Uh, do we start? Yeah. Yep, you're on. You're on camera. This is our presentation on our script that we've been working on. It's called Humans of Earth. Hopefully that changes. Uh, it's, and also we're going to talk about the democratization of media. So we are. What is democratization? Uh, traditionally speaking, it's networks and corporations would sort of produce and ask for things to be made, and they would all fund that and market it and do all of that. Democratization, however, is making all them tools more easily, readily available to us, who are essentially the public. Sorry. And then also being able to get direct to the consumer and using new platforms such as social media and such like that, that we can go to them directly without having to go through the traditional route. So what is our specific question here? It is how does the ease of access to a plethora of social media platforms challenge the traditional distribution model for, social, for media content? Specifically, the use of social media to connect with and collaborate, to collaborate with other people who aren't traditionally in the industry and directly reach reach the consumer, crowdfunding, its benefits, deficits, and how we can possibly use it to our advantage, and our project itself, how are we collaborating together, and what are we taking from this research we're about to share with you to our project going forward. So how have we been collaborating? We've been using things such as Writers Duet, so we have, which is a professional uh, program which allows us to work together live on a script, so it is in association with Microsoft Teams, which allows us to stay on call for are essentially and talk as we do the live edits and also we can share files and production this stuff like that on there and also we've been using an excel document to plan out our task tasks as well as keep us all on track and make sure nothing's missed here's a wee sneak peek at that uh, it's a simple traffic light system red get your ass in here yellow it's okay and complete it it's done stop worrying you can see very clearly dates are organized tasks being allocated what action is it that needs to be taken? Who's doing it? When's it due? And then we come to a consensus. Do we like it? Do we not? What needs changed? It needs changed in the notes. Bang, it's a new one. That happened with Matt's. We made him the ad pros and cons. He's the only one who had to do it again. It's your fault. Um, so we've, of course, as you can see, been using remote collaboration. So what are the advantages of that compared to the traditional studio collaboration? Flexibility, affordability, and diversity. Flexibility, no matter where we are, we're able to connect and talk to each other. We don't have to factor in schedules or travel time as much. So as affordability, study shows that it's much cheaper for companies essentially to work remotely as opposed to actually meeting up in person and getting office space. Diversity, if we want to tell stories about certain people, different ethnicities and stuff like that, or even get professional people abroad, we can simply hop on a call with them and we're straight to them. What are the cons of that, however? Inclusion, interaction, distraction. Inclusion, we're cutting out some people who aren't as tech savvy, Fergus. Um, interaction, <laughs> interaction. Uh, we don't have those water cooler moments where we have a natural development of the script and talking about different parts of the project. That's, of course, missed out on a little. Distraction, of course, we are at home. Your life's gonna get in the way by working at home, so you are. Um, yeah, that, you've got the internet in front of you, you're gonna get distracted. Who's talking to you, even though you already know us? Meet the team, we've got Fergus. Fergus is, was working on the team as a writer. He's also spearheading our marketing document, and he's going to talk to you in a minute here about the social media side of things. So he is Matt. He sort of took the lead with the script. So he did, and he's worked through on crowdfunding. I'll join him at the end and talk about our project. And me, I was working on project management, sort of keeping the Excel document in order, as well as I also collaborate on the script. And I'll see you at the end. Fergus, please take care. Okay. okay, so essentially uh, you can use social media in three different ways, three different stages in your production. Um, firstly, obviously, to help secure funding, crowdfunding, we've talked about already. If you want to cast a net out to get your cast and your crew, uh, and you can also use it to market and promote your film when it's complete. Um, I think one of the very important things is that if you're going to do social media well, you've got to actually plan to do it. Um, there's that old maxim, feel the plan, plan to feel. Um, we've been planning from the start, you'll see this through the presentation. Phasing is an absolutely vital part of social media. Uh, you know yourself in terms of Kickstarter and other funds. When you launch, you get a boost, then there's a big gap, and then at the end, you're racing to try and get over the line, etc. So if you actually phase your whole campaign, 
you can get over that particular hump. Another way in terms of Facebook, each social media reaches a different audience. So if I say to you, Facebook reaches people who are over 50s by and large, deep pockets, plenty of money, reach out, etc. What's the best time to hit them with Facebook? Before 10 o'clock in the morning and after 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Maximum audiences. Targeting. Social media allows you to micro-target. Um, I come from a very different background in terms of doing advertising. I've done you know, a £250,000 ad campaign. That literally is like taking a shotgun and firing it. Micro-targeting, which you can do on social media, means that you can actually use the demographics to target your audience. We're doing a sci-fi film. You might say there's not many sci-fi folk in Northern Ireland, but we can reach out globally using social media and micro-target them. Responding, it is so, so important that you do not leave it to the day after. You've got to man when you're doing crowdfunding all the way through 24 hours. If somebody comes in with an ask, they're not going to wait for you to get back to them tomorrow. They want to know now, so that's important. Data capture, somebody comes and approaches you on social media. Remember, it's a two-way communication tool, and they ask, Kieran, tell me this, um, when do you actually think you'll have the film complete and where can I see it? Okay, if you've got your data capture in that, you'll know that individual already wants to know all about your film and realise it. Why not hit them then with an ask, get back to them, it will be done by such and such, would you like to chip in? Continuous evaluation, you started with a marketing campaign, you've planned it, you're now executing it, but are you reviewing it as you're doing it? You can spend a lot of money in this and absolutely fail, but if you manage it and do it well, continuous evaluation, you can change things as you go along. Social media also is about your cast and your crew and so on. I've just put up some examples of various different groups that are out there on social media to contact each of those. Um, I've broadly just looked across the British Isles, but obviously you can look globally and so on. Each has got their strengths. Um, uh, but that's a, an example. Oops. Uh, key aspect of all of this is, you know, it's about global reach. You can actually reach out. You no longer are tied parochially. It enables micro-targeting. You can be very, very specific. You can reach out to all those nerds and geeks who absolutely love sci-fi. It facilitates you to actually get a better cast and crew because you can cast your net to when people are available, not just waiting for them to become available. You can request mentoring support. Um, I, that's a big thing you know, for me. If we're newbies and out there and so on, there's always people out there who are willing to give you off their time, and time is critical. You don't have to pay for that. Signposting, um, one of the things I've picked up looking across all of those particular social media sites and so on is lots of people put information about when there's calls out there for funding and, and commissions and so on. You can pick that. And the most, the most important thing of all of this is at the end of the day, you're marketing yourself. The deficits, of course, are this is a competitive industry. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody's out there to get their script made. And as you do this, you have to be very, very confident that you've got everything nailed down and somebody just doesn't steal your idea and run with it. You can fall back into a very bad habit of a very narrow tool. You know, you've raised your money globally, but you're spending it locally. Marketing globally is a danger. I want to avoid cover that you're going to be sucked back properly. Um, commissioning in Northern Ireland, by and large, is still about who you know. You know, the very fact that the screenwriting, whatever, is closed demonstrates that to a greater extent. What about all the new talent coming in? Um, maintaining and utilising social media, it's very time consuming. We've talked about this and we've said, okay, if we were doing this live, we'd have to allocate eight hours a day and do shifts so we can respond. Uh, you also have to create all these media in the first instance so that your marketing assets actually really sell. This is a quality product. Social media platforms, um, you may not know this, but somebody like Facebook, the minute you post on Facebook, they own what you post on Facebook. So you're giving it away for free, and you may find your, your stuff turning up in other people's uh, media. I'm going to hand over now to Matt, who's going to talk about funding and crowdfunding. Okay, thank thank you. you. For a lot, of, um, a lot of indie filmmakers, the first part where you're going to find any of your money is your own pocket. Going to be scraping around, you know, you might, for example, for most studio productions, the only real cost you have is when you've got an actor that you're going to uh, buy them lunch, pay for their bus fare, 
a lot of that can come out of your own pocket. Even whenever you're getting into some indie ones and um, indie films, it's it is something self funded where there might be a small amount of budget for transport or maybe maybe some consideration given to an actor that's coming on board. Um, put my glasses on. Um, further than that, you can take what they, they call FFF, friends, family, and foes. Find somebody that you know that really likes the idea of being an executive producer that wants to put a couple of hundred quid into something. You know, that is possible. It has worked in the past. People are clubbing together. I, myself, I've, pr I've produced a, a book which was a group of friends putting in some money to cover the printing costs that enabled us to print this thing and get it out there. We were students at the time, but it really, really worked. The next stage is government funding, right? That is a paperwork exercise, right? You have to know what you're doing. There's a way to fill in forms. But once you're familiar with that way, you can actually be quite successful at getting it. There's no reason why anybody here couldn't you know, access uh, some of the development funds for the Northern Ireland screen. Right? They're, they're easy, they are accessible. Yes, you have to show some commitment by having some background in film, having produced a short previously, et cetera, et cetera, or having some work done. But that's, that's just to give some sort of barrier because to be honest, anybody can apply for this. So you want to show that you have some sort of commitment. And there's the, uh, the idea of some private investment. It does work, it has happened. Uh, the Shore, which was Oscar winning, had private investment from Lockshore Investments, and that did work, but, um, and obviously having an Oscar is, is great, but it's few and far between. It's very hard to sell the idea of, a pri of, of private equity investment to an investor. So that brings us on to crowdfunding, and what the, what's so special about crowdfunding? Crowdfunding, I actually love the idea of it, because rather than having to convince one commissioner or one executive in Northern Ireland screen that my idea is brilliant, I have the opportunity to speak to 10,000, maybe 10 million people, right? I only may need 1% of them to agree with me and put a little bit of money. I'm not asking one person for 10,000 pounds, I'm asking 10,000 people for one pound. And that's a very exciting prospect. Now the big two platforms out there, there's lots of them out there, but the big two are really Google and Kickstarter. So they have massive audiences, so why wouldn't you use one of those? It headlines also multi-million pound um, projects. Right. You are crowdfunding for product, not for equity, so you retain all of that. Whereas you know, in some funding schemes, for example, Northern Ireland Screens funding schemes, you're actually giving away part of the profits of your, uh, of your production. And there are different risks for each of these. Um, Indiegogo tends to have lower amounts of money, but that's because it's, it's not, it doesn't have the same all or nothing with Kickstarter. With Kickstarter, when you're putting your, your project out there, you have to hit your target or you miss everything. So looking at Kickstarter, you can see some of these figures here, $11 million, $5 million, $3 million, you know, 46,000 backers, 88,000 backers. There's 75,000 projects in November 2020 that were filmed in video on Kickstarter, and half of those were essentially into that sort of low-end indie filmmaking, you know, where the budget is less than $7,000. In 2009, the average was $12,000. In 2015, it was $143,000. Now, if you went to Northern Ireland Screen with, with $143,000 in the bank and said, I'd like you to match this, right, that would be a large production in Northern Ireland. That would be an immense success. And you've already got this market of, I don't know, probably 20,000 people that said they wanted to give you stuff. Sci-fi and fantasy are some of the biggest categories in Kickstarter, which is one of our reasons for choosing this, this genre. Now, it also really helps, really, really helps if you have some background. I mean, these guys here are a successful web series, so they got $11 million. These guys here, this is uh, MST3K, which was a TV series, $5 million. This is the reboot of uh, like a movie for Veronica Mars to kind of finish off that story, $5 million. Having the stars of these, you know, incredibly successful projects or having the brand really, really helps. Now, we're not all going to have that, but, you know, if you use something that's, you know, moving over from another medium, like, for example, a com comic adaptation, a podcast, or a web series, if you're doing this right, you should have built up some sort of reputation beforehand. Produce micro episodes and then go for the big one. Um, additional success from reputation or experience of actors, um, director or crew. If you've got something that you can promote, if somebody's worked on a practical effects movie, you'd use that. If they've got an IMDb listing, you'd use that. You figure out if there's anything that they have. Anybody that's award winning, make sure you tell them about it. And you might just be lucky and hit the zeitgeist. What do I mean by that? You know. I don't know, 20 years ago, I don't know when it was, 15 years ago, you had DreamWorks and you had Pixar, both brought out bug-related movies, A Bug's Life and Ant City, right? That, that's not a coincidence. 
right? Somebody mentioned something, both studios, I mean, these things, it wasn't like, you know, one of them announced it and the other one suddenly got, got going on it. It was just a zeitgeist, maybe somebody was shopping a script around and it just hit the right time and the right place. You'd have these two big movies appearing, you know, within months of each other. Look out for the zeitgeist. Remember that the industry moves in cycles and it also moves in waves. The biggest problem you're going to have, I would say, especially for an indie filmmaker, is that nobody cares. Right? You may have an audience of 100 million people, potentially on a Kickstarter, right? but there are lots of projects where it's 0% funded with four days to go, or 0% funded with 11 days to go, only a pound pledged. Right? That is, nobody gives a damn about your project, and there could be a hundred reasons for that, that you didn't respond right to them, that your initial intro movie was terrible, that actually is not a good idea. Right? You also want to look, so projects that don't find an audience, that's what it boils down to, but also projects for the creator isn't even willing to put their own money in. Right? If I was going to start a Kickstarter project, the first thing I'd do is I would beg, borrow, and steal a thousand pounds and bump it in there as the first pledge. Right? Because then that shows somebody else goes, oh, somebody likes this. At the moment, what you basically know is that nobody gives a shit about this project. Zero percent funded. Even getting into projects we love with Kickstarter staff that picked you out for special treatment doesn't, get, doesn't guarantee success. So you have to do something more. You have to make yourself a little bit special. Now here's another example. You can shoot yourself in the foot. This project here has raised 90,000 euro. They're 90% funded. They've got four hours to go. What if they don't get that last 10,000 euro to bring them up to 100,000? Under the Kickstarter rules, they lose everything. It all disappears. If you're in that situation, beg, borrow, steal the last $10,000 and 10,000 euros to get yourself over that lip. Doesn't matter where it's from. Go and talk to the bank, sell a kidney, do something, get yourself over that lip. A bank will even give you a bridging loan if you get the right kind of bank manager. But find a way to get over that because if for the, the cost of £10,000 you lost the entire €90,000, that would be an absolute crime. Because I guarantee that if you are smart, you'd put a budget up there of 100000 but you know what? You could probably do it for 80. You could probably skim off some things, cut back some things, and still make the project. If you really want the project, make sure you get over that turbo. There are, um, so again, unlike e equity investment, people pledge for rewards. They want uh, a digital copy of the film, a DVD of the film, a Blu-ray of the film. They want the t-shirts. And there's also this possibility is that they just want to see it happen, so they're pledging for goodwill. They don't want to give a damn about whether or not it works. It just is a cool project and you are ambitious. You want to try and engender that, that you're one of the people that you're, you know, this, this democratization idea is actually more like politics than you think. It is, you are meant to be liked by these people so that they will put you in that position that you can realize your dream. So, and remember, if you don't reach the total on Kickstarter, all is lost. It's like being the, you know, the second in an election. It's like being Pepsi, actually that, that's not a good example because Pepsi are doing really well for themselves, but you know, um, <laughs> there still is a need to be tactical and there's a need for a plan. <coughs> Using Bing tools like Kickstarter, now, uh, Kickstarter has their own project management tool. But KickTrack is fascinating because you can go back and you can analyze exactly how much went into each project. You can put in any project you want. So if you're making a film, find a film that's like yours, put its details into KickTrack, and it will tell you. It shows you, the, you know, how many people put in money at the start. This chasm of despair where nobody was putting in any money, and then this, this, this little bump at the end. And you'll see that repeated again and again. And a lot of the time, what you'll find is you can work it out from the amount of people are pledging. But a lot of the time, this last bump is actually the people who are owning it, you know, the project creators, going, we're, we're, we're not quite at the total. Let's stick in 10 grand. You know, find the rich uncle. Give up the, you know, reach out the back of the sofa. Find that money and get ourselves over that. You need eyeballs looking at this. You need to have lots of social media presence and an awful lot of responding and phasing, just like we said earlier, just so you can make sure that every single one of those eyeballs there is not just looking at it, they're paying for it, right? It's like that old adage, I don't care about your business card, you can give me your credit card. You need a strategy for inevitable success, right? So that it doesn't matter if you're not getting exactly what you want, that you're going to succeed because your next Kickstarter will depend on whether or not this one was successful. It's much easier to get a successful Kickstarter if you've already had one. So don't fail on your Kickstarter. You should know the first time you, the day one when you kick off your Kickstarter, that it's gonna work. And it does really help if you're already famous. So if anybody's got that going for them, use it. Now, 
Is it better than the traditional route? I personally think so. This idea of convincing a really small number of people for a large amount of money and the success and failure is black and white. You get a yes or no very, very quickly. And I know from personal experience that no is going. I also know that the yes is intimidating. But when you're doing it on a, on a, on a crowdfunding, you've got thousands of people that basically say, yeah, I like what I'm hearing. It's not based on such a black and white idea. Except as in the film, the film festivals, again, getting in there is on the basis of a small number of people, right? The film festival gives you access to a large number of people watching it, increases your views, but even getting on there is a small number of people. You're, you're being held hostage by these small numbers of people. Crowdfunding, it's much more shades of grey. You're convincing a large number of people out of a huge number of people to back your project. You can fail, but you've got direct control over, the, over that outcome. A lot of it really boils down to is your communication on the scratch. Ultimately, you can't make a silk purse out of a size either. Right? If it's a crap project, it's not going to get funded. Right? But you should know from day one, when you kick off your Kickstarter, that this is going to get funded. You should know. So what's our plan? My first part of the plan was get Irish passports and go to Spain because I want this to be my last Irish winter. Right? The guys did not go for that plan. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to do was develop a pitch document, recruit a good director, get a good cast list to find out who's available and who's interested, and film a great intro for our Kickstarter, which is probably a better plan than mine. But that's what the plan seems to be at the start. We can see some effective film uh, examples with small cast and crew. Now, Ten Clove was a blockbuster movie, right? But it really boiled down to three people in a bunker. Right? That could have been done. You could have filmed that over a weekend with probably two or three hundred pounds for pizza. You could have done it that way. Maybe not the, S, the special effects part of the end, but you know, you could have done it that way. Fall. We all watched Fall. That was two kids in a quarry. What did it require? An awful lot of brain power, but not a lot, not a lot of budget. Uh, with Neil and I, you could cut out all the extra characters and really just have uh, McGann and Grant talking at each other the way, and that would have actually still made a great movie. It didn't need the, the larger budget that it had. And Alone, which we're going to focus on, is a short film. There were three people involved in that film. One cast was, well, there were three cast members, uh, two were voice only, but there was one cast on screen, and there were only two crew, one of whom was the cast member. So, this example, incredibly small cast, just one dude, monologue. There was very, he didn't have to, he didn't actually speak any lines, so there was really, really reduced need for audio sync, uh, just a bit of Foley. The runtime was 5 minutes 30 seconds, 3.6 million views on YouTube. It was award winning, we'll link to it there. Um, but it, it, uh, that's such a tiny budget, and actually it got a huge success, and I guarantee that the people involved went on to bigger and greater things because they can always point at that project and go, yeah, you know what, we don't suck. Um, what lessons are we applying to our script? Right? Cast and crew members manageable. People are your biggest problem. Make sure the genre and themes can be explained. Make sure that it can be explained. I shouldn't have to say this a third time, but I will. Make sure it can be explained. I don't care if you say that it's Godfather, but we're using insects to represent all the mafia people, or if it's basic instinct, but with squirrels. I don't care what it is. Make it relatable and explainable. Keep your locations limited. Locations are cost, transport is cost. There's also a health and safety issue you know, with more locations. And keep your rewards relevant. Existing resources, signed copy of the script, art plates, special DVD edition, posters, lists and credits, executive producer. Something's achievable. Don't be promising that you're going to fly somebody out to actually meet the cast and crew, because you know what? They could be in New Zealand. That's the problem. It's great if they're in Belfast, not so great if they're in New Zealand. That's going to cost you a fortune. Peter? Here's what we're applying to our script. It's it's very easy. Uh, it's three cast members. You've got the dad, the son, and then you got that alien thing. Don't know how to do that yet, but it's there. Project has one location. It's a farm that comes with its whole barn field usual scenario. Uh, for the geeks, science fiction, of course, is going to be promoted because Kickstarter we've seen science fiction as well. It's sci-fi. So we'll for that. For funders, we can tell there's going to be refugee and inclusion elements. That's sort of like an underlying theme. Hopefully, that's a bit relevant. If we can want to go to a traditional conventioner, they'll go, yep, that's going to grand. For backers, we have a checklist of materials and products for generation. On our marketing document, we've got a wee list as to what exactly we're going to 
give to people. Uh, just use stuff like posters and yada yada yada. And for Kickstarter, we've got some. We're going to get some standard visitors, visuals. That's our mood board made by Matt. Yeah. There you go. Some visuals. Uh, and then Fergus threw together some poster things that we did. And then that's our one log line. Father and son story at the end of the world. Simple, clean, to the end. Do you have any questions? I've run out of stuff sound. Uh, yep, run close. Um, nope, that's five more behind the Well done. <laughs>